Good Shepherd. I've served at uh, Brentwood as the pastor of Inviting Ministries for six years back in the early 2000s. Uh, Bethlehem United Methodist as an associate pastor and at Pleasant View and uh, near between Clarksville and Nashville, halfway between there for four years. And now I was appointed to Good Shepherd in Hendersonville. I've um, been there two months. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, wide swath of different sized churches, the largest to to smaller ones. And I started out, of course, serving smaller churches and seminary, that sort of thing. But my idea today is not to, to give you um, deep stuff, but to give you a bunch of stuff. But the idea that, that, that I wanted to get across today especially is, is that there are a lot of ways to do uh, stewardship. More than just the average, you know, let's have October to get together and we're just going to pound it out for four weeks and then, you know, and we're going to give you a card and you just fill it out and that's what we do. You know, so... This, things are starting to change that way, but some of the things that I wanted to make mention of about some critical things is, is that we need to understand that growing generous givers is a spiritual issue about discipleship. It's not a financial thing. I've already been in my church for two months. I've discussed money every Sunday. People were scared and afraid, and, but I don't, I don't do it like, you know, what I say to them is, is that this is a spiritual issue. It's about who we are. It's, it's as important as our prayers and our presence and our service and our witness. It's no less or no more important, but it is important. Also, um, teaching biblical foundations places the topic under biblical authority. In the Bible, and what Jesus talked about money more than any other topic, yet somehow we seem to pretend like he didn't. You know, there's over a thousand verses that are on, that are on money. I mean, every, every, most of the parables when he talked are talking about that. Why is that? Because money at that point, the same as it is in our lives today, is, is an essential part of who we are. And how we utilize our resources, our financial resources, determines much about who we are. Both then and now. The toys may have changed, but the toys are still around. And stewardship is not about the budget, but giving to God. If you focus stewardship around the idea that you're just trying to meet the budget for that year, that will never work anymore. That day's done. The day of the builder generation where they simply give a certain amount and they tithe because they're supposed to and everything else, that doesn't work. People will give towards something they believe in. They will not give towards a budget. And then telling the stories of transformed lives motivates people to give. You need to begin to tell the story of people who are being transformed all year. Not just, you know, I'm going to get somebody to talk for this week on this and this week on this. And then, you know, for four weeks you tell the story and the rest of the year you don't tell anything. It needs to become something where the stories start happening and you start using them right then. Don't wait until it's time for the stewardship campaign. Once again, like I said, don't use the word campaign. Every gathering is an opportunity to grow generosity with a creative thank you. Be thankful to your people. Be thankful to those who serve, those who give. Find ways. To, we had a situation this past uh, week where I'm of the tenant that if you don't ask, you can't receive. So we've been struggling at Good Shepherd, if you know anything about us, and uh, have a massive amount of debt, and even could even power up our lights outside for a while and various other things. And one of the things we've been having to do is cut our own grass, which for our congregation is huge. We have, how many acres do we have, Sean? Deep, probably three acres all the way around, plus everything around our CLC, which is larger than this CLC, and everything else. And our own people having to cut the grass. Well, one of the things is they, they're worn out about doing that. So what I, what, I, what I kept saying was, if you could help us out by giving us a mower, a large mower, or something like that. Well, right before we started our Wednesday nights, just this past uh, uh, two weeks ago, we had somebody from the congregation that came to us and said, uh, I'm in the landscaping business. I'm pulling all my crews off of their jobs and coming over to mow this before our Wednesday night starts. So in the pouring down rain on a Tuesday, which is a huge storm for us, she pulled all her crews out of their landscaping. I had no idea who she was. And pulled them all over, and they mowed the whole entire thing. And I, I said, thank you so much for your generosity in helping us. And now they're trying to figure out how they can help us all the time. But if we don't ask, we won't receive. And people are wanting to give what they have to offer you, but if you don't ask, they're not just going to come up to you and say, hey, you know what, I'll cut the grass. They see the need, they see the need for that. 
And then growing generous givers is a long-term commitment. It's not a stewardship campaign. It needs to be something we work on continuously. And then you understand your current giving patterns. You know, how does giving work right now? How do you want it to change? You know, if you do the pledge card every year and it doesn't work, don't keep doing it. If you only get 20, 30%, stop. You know, it's not working. Um, especially, maybe you need to change that card. Maybe it needs to be something where you don't sign it. I started to realize that people don't want to sign those things, yet they still want to be able to commit. Took the signature off of it, I got a lot more, and the money still came in exactly the way it was supposed to because they made their own commitment. Not something they had to write down where they felt like they might not be able to, to do it. And it worked the exact same way, actually worked better. A year-round strategy moves through to all aspects of life, not just the annual fall commitment campaign. That's something we're going to talk about some. And define the role of the finance committee related to stewardship. Now, what do they really do? I mean, is there one person in charge of it? Is there really a group that talks about it? Does everybody in August all of a sudden get crazy about it and try to figure out what to do in two months? I mean, I'll be honest with you. I'm the pastor that develops stewardship, you know, emphasis like that and, you know, get the latest thing that comes out and I got two months to get it together. I don't involve anybody else and by the time we get there, you know, that's where we find ourselves. And what's the role of the pastor in that? You know, what does the pastor do? How is your pastor involved in stewardship? And then, if you know people want to be generous, you know, help them to be able to figure out how to do that. If they are, like the bishop said, in debt, and you know your folks are in debt, and there's a good percentage of them, and they're more than you think that there are, what are you doing to help them get out of debt? Because they can't give until they get out of debt. They've still got to pay the bills. And then having a real stewardship team, not one person assigned for finances in charge of stewardship. And what that means are all things that are, that are, that are important. And when I was kind of talking, thinking about this thing through, there seems to be two kind of actual ways to look at year-round stewardship, which I haven't really thought about. I was thinking about year-round stewardship as being um, that throughout the whole year you're doing different kinds of stewardship. But there's also could be year-round stewardship where you're actually focused on financial things, but all year round. So you're not simply coming to them at one time or another. So the first one's an actual 12-month plan for focusing mainly on financial stewardship. And one of the things that, that I came across that I thought was very interesting you have all these websites um, is a calendar. This is a planning calendar from the ELCA church, from church. And they have a focus. Like here's January, you know, earth keeping, growth, giftedness, finances, lifestyle, planning. So there's, there's that part of it. They focus on different things every month. So that's, that's an option. I saw another one that was set up to just be finance stuff. What do you plan? You know, if you're talking about money, is more than just one month, one month out of the year, how do you talk about it the rest of the year? Every Sunday, does your pastor or somebody else get up and give a testimony about tithing or about stewardship, financial stewardship? What, what do they do with that? You know, what's your offering look like? What's your offering, you know, offertory time look like? What do you say? You know, every Sunday, what I talk about is, is that, you know, we have gathered together to bring our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. These are all important to God, and God wants them equally. We brought our prayers ready this morning through our prayer request. I ask you to bring your presence by passing the pads down the row and back again. You know, during the summer right now, what I've said to them is, is that you know a lot of us travel during the summer. And that you know sometimes a lot of us are weekly givers, and if you're not here, then we, and then the ability to give doesn't happen. We'd love for you to catch up. You know, what my folks did. They caught up. First two, the first. Sundays of the t first two months, like so the first Sunday when the biggest offering usually comes in for most people, those are the largest offerings in the church's recent history. All I said was one sentence. I didn't browbeat anybody. I didn't do anything. I didn't say, hey, you need to... All I said was, here's the opportunity. And what do you want to do with it? So you got to figure out, you know, how, how do you do that in a, on a regular basis? If you just wait for the campaign to happen every time, how are you going to do... You know, what are you going to do with that? Another great resource is, is from the Lewis Leadership Center. It's fostering a culture of generosity. And on that, it has things like narrative budgets we'll talk about today. It has how to do stewardship year-round. It has all of that. And the, the, the DVD-CD um, combo is $75.
but they give you all these talks and things about how you can foster a culture of generosity. It's one of the best things out there. Um, and I'll send you those links as well. Yes. Yes. Yes, you can sign up and there are great articles in that as well. And we can get that, that link as well. But it's the Lewis Leadership, is that what it's called directly? Yeah, Lewis Center for Church Leadership, right? Um, out of uh, St. Paul. And so why do year-round stewardship? This is an article that I would picked up. and is, um, It's not a way to get money out of people every month. It's, really a, it's not really a church program. It's a spiritual matter. If it is a spiritual matter, then why would you commit to only one month a year where you talk about it? That just shows everybody that you're really focused on doing one thing, which is what? Meeting the budget. Here comes again. Here comes October, September. Here comes the annual stewardship. Let's get our saddlebags out and let's go, you know. You automatically tell everybody exactly what you're doing, which is I'm just focused on getting your money. And I might sprinkle in a little bit of prayers and maybe some, some attendance, presence kind of thing, but I'm focused on getting your money. And, but, it's, but it needs to be a spiritual matter instead. It's a lifestyle, part of our daily Christian living. Every time we have opportunity to be able to share with people why it's important. It's not important to give to the budget. It's important to give because God has given to us. And what I tell everybody every Sunday is, you are blessed to be a blessing to others. That's why you've been given this. You're blessed to be a blessing to others. And it's an ongoing permanent part of the, of the congregation's life. It's not the next thing that comes down the pike. It's not, you know, Mike Slaughter stuff. It's not Adam Hamilton's. And you can use all those things, and I do. I'm about to use enough again, which is a great one by Adam Hamilton, to start off again with, with Good Shepherd. But that can't be the only thing you do. And here's at least five reasons that uh, participate in year-round stewardship. We learned that stewardship is a lens through which we can see all of our ministries. Stewardship becomes the basis by which we do everything of any resource. It isn't just financial, but it is financial. Because the other thing we like to do is we like, we like to play down the financial part. We like to go, oh, well, you know, it's about prayers, and it's about presence, and it's about environmental stewardship. And, and we like to play down then finances being, well, and finances. No, they're equal. But you don't see that unless you see the lens that all of this works together in the same way. And then a year-round approach teaches folks the bedro bedrock of stewardship education. What is stewardship? You know, some of your folks don't even know. Like, when I preached in that October I told you about, when I preached about what tithing actually was and where it was biblical and that sort of thing, well, most of my folks didn't know anything about it. So if you assume everybody knows what a tithe is or understands what the Bible has to say about giving, they probably don't. If they've come from somewhere else outside of your church, they probably surely don't. And we have to make sure that they at least understand it. Then they can decide and say, you know what, I don't really agree with that. But they got to at least know what it's about. And then developing personal stewardship. What do we do with our resources? One of the sermons that I've done already was, was, uh, was on the lectionary passages that were a couple weeks ago about the life-giving power of giving. You know, there was two, two things where Jesus was talking about, you know, the storehouses, you know, and the, and the guy stores everything up, and then he dies, and God calls him a what? A fool. Now, how many times do you see that in the Bible, that God calls somebody a fool? And we talked about that, which is, look at your checkbook. Where does your checkbook, where is it written to? Where do you see your money going to? Because that will tell you where your heart is. That'll tell you what you worship pretty quickly to look at your bank account and be able to figure that out. People started to think about that, which is, okay, what do I spend it all on? Is it going out to eat? Is it going on vacation? You know, how much do I really give to the church? And I said, you know, do you give 1%, 2%, 3%? How much do you spend on yourself? And they got them to think about it. And then that also provides a channel to give according to their values. If you're giving them an opportunity, people have told me before, like, don't, don't have too many offerings, but too many special offerings. People won't, it'll, it'll dilute your money. I've never seen that happen. What I have for people, though, is, is that this is a, above and beyond your giving to the church. You have to make that clear, which is, is that, you know, especially in, in my situation where we're very much underwater, is that 
I'm all for you giving to other things besides the church or besides the general budget. But, but, but understand, this has to be beyond what you give to us to keep the lights on and do everything else. But special offerings, when they come across, not everybody's going to give to a special offering. Some will give to this one. Some will give to that one. For you to decide, some to limit that and say, you know what, you know, we can't do that. It doesn't really, you know. You want to give them as many chances as possible to give. You don't want it to be an on-off again thing. You want it to be in a constant thing, which is, here's a need. Do you want to meet it? Do you want to help with this need? Do you want to help with this? You're blessed to be in this way, and you feel strongly about this over here. And then also, year-round gives a connection between worship and mission and a context for interpreting our connectional ministries. You know, how do you talk about the apportionments? Ugh. Apportionment for others, yeah. A share, a fair share, yep. Nobody cares about that. They don't. What they care about is the stories. And there are lots of good stories of where our money goes. You know, I keep telling my church who has paid 0.001% of their apportionments as they've been in serious debt for the last several years and almost closed their doors, is that the reason we do this is that we're connectional in the way we can serve better. You know, our UM core is as big as the Red Cross and is on the ground in places, and your money goes to that. But you also can't just play all that stuff off because the top two apportionments in, in are the pastor's insurance and pastor's pension. And I have told them, you've not been paying the pastor's pension or insurance for a number of years. Saundersville, which is about 60 people down the road, has been paying your portion. Is that what we really want to do when we don't do that part of it? That's the biggest thing. As in your church, what are the two biggest things in your church as far as the budget? Staff and trustees. Your program ministry is probably less than 10% of your entire budget. So don't, don't pretend to be something else like it's just all children, it's all youth, and get all those flashy pictures up there either. You know, keeping the lights on is, is as important sometimes as taking care of missions and that sort of thing as well. So you do both. So this is really interesting out of a diocese in Texas, an Episcopal diocese, is how they've broken down a whole, a whole idea of stewardship in a holistic way. So you can do financial stewardship all the time during the course of a year. Here's where they've taken other things and brought those together. West End also is doing uh, did this this past year as well, the last couple of years I think. They're taking a season for each one of kind of prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And I don't have much information on West End's material, but I remember seeing it and thought it was very interesting that they're taking a whole, like two months for each one kind of thing. But here you see how they've broken it down into God's creation, spiritual growth, the ministry spotlight, financial health, and outside of ourselves. And they've taken those pieces and then taking them apart. So spiritual growth. Connection to a healthy spiritual life. Spiritual component. You know, this is where our prayers might focus into. It might be our presence, that sort of thing. So that's a theme of the month. They'll, they'll break it down into the course of a year and figure out a theme. Whatever your themes are going to be. They could be our five usual things. They could be something else. Whatever your group. And this is the other thing. is If you don't have a clear vision of who your church is, it is hard then to help your people understand who they are. So unless you know who you are, you can't help them know who they are as part of the congregation. You know, and the generic things that we have as United Methodist Church are not good enough for that. They're a great place to start, but you know, we, like at, at a Good Shepherd, we are um, a worshiping congregation focused on inviting and nurturing, equipping, and deploying. And I'm like, Okay, how does that work itself out? How are we living into that? And so the biggest thing was is trying to figure out, as I've done before, some words that go around that. So we've kind of come up with connect, grow, and go. So connect. You know, how do we connect people both to Christ and to the church? Grow. Grow is this for us. Go is missions and congregational care. Going inside, going outside the church. But that helps us to figure out then, you know, how, how this works. What do we mean by spiritual growth? What are the markers of spiritual growth going to be? You went to the disciple. You're in a Bible study. You're in a small group. What are you talking about? You've got, to, you've got to focus those things out to know before you can do this kind of thing. Ministry spotlight 
and that's a bunch of ministry, anything, anything that's missions, time and talent, part of stewardship for them. But they've got a special time of the year to do that. So instead of doing it all at once, you spread it out. Maybe you have your, your service piece of it during the spring. Starting off a brand new year in January. How to get active. When do all of our groups start as far as our lay leadership stuff? January. You know, maybe that should find your peace or maybe it's a summertime thing or whatever. Financial health, of course, which you talked about. So instead of there being, yeah, it still comes during one part of the year, but it isn't the only thing that comes down the pike. So there's a big difference with that and be able to figure that out. And by all means, I have not lived into this. So I'm not telling you like that I've got it all figured out. I'm not writing a book on it or anything. Outside of ourselves. Now, how do you go outside? So that's a big, so that's a big thing then. You spend time working on how we're going to go outside of the church. Because that's stewardship of your neighborhood, of your community. Are you being good stewards of them? Are you, are you, are you empowering them? Are you connecting with them? Are you helping them? And, you know, those kind of things. One of the big things that we're starting at, at Good Shepherd is, is that we are partnering with Second Harvest to bring the mobile food pantry to Hendersonville. They fill up a huge tractor trailer full of food up to the top. You buy it for 2500 or less, depending on what grants you get. They bring it, and it feeds 800 families after you've unloaded it. You bring carts. You shop with them. You pray with them. You do all this. That's an, we are trying to get outside of ourselves. We have the facility. Now we've got to stop looking at ourselves and go outside and find who needs our help the most. And that could be a, a focus during the course of the year. Right now, this is a big focus for us, even though it's not explicitly stated. God's creation. Once again, stewardship of God's creation. So the environmental piece. How is your church doing that both inside and outside? How are you teaching your folks to be a part of that? At what level do you believe in that? Some are very, very green. And some are very, very not green. You know, where do you find yourself? That is an important part. And it is biblical. You know, God did say that. That we are to be stewards of all creation. So how do you, how you do that? That's an important piece for them. Another way you can do it then is you can divide into quarterly focus. That's a monthly focus. Maybe you want to do it quarterly. Maybe you want to figure out how to do two or three months at a time or something like that. So this other group did a natural breaking it down by January and talk about time. What happens at the beginning of January? A new year resolutions. I'm going to do this, that, or the other. We're very focused on time during the beginning of the year. So how's your time going to be used this year? How are you going to, how are you going to be able to do it? Beginning in January, if you had a whole sermon series and a whole, and a whole focus as a church, on time. You know, that could be something. Then like in May, around Arbor Day, they've chosen to be able to focus on Earth and the creation. Earth Day, that time of year could be something that might, might work well. September. Labor Day. Stewardship of talent. How do you use your gifts? In October and November, that's when they discuss money. Well, that's typical time. And I'm not saying change typical time. People do expect that's going to happen. And it coincides with most of us have our budgets due when? January. You don't want to go too far because you get into Christmas and it becomes a big mess and all that. So you got to stay in October, you know, early November, basically, or September. You have to get back from being on the road and being on vacation and in school and not going to all the football games every weekend and everything else. I've been there. So you, you can still do that, but you see, with that plan, you can seriously say to your congregation, we're not focused on money all the time. We think they're all important. And then for us, I mean, how, how do you live this part out? Prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. How do you do into those? I forgot to bring a bullet in the day from our church, but I, I've just gotten the idea over the last several years that I want to incorporate every week in the bullets in these things. So what I do is I have a prayer list. That's, that's pretty basic, you know, and, and we have people that, you know, an email prayer team, and we have a prayer group that meets at 10 o'clock on Monday mornings, and we give all those encouragements in the bulletin as well. And there are groups that want to meet. And then presence. And the presence, the only way they have it in the bulletin is the number. So people can see that that is part of it. This is the number. And 
talk about the fact is is that you know we, we want you to share your presence with us and be involved in worship on Sunday mornings. When I discuss membership, I talk about the fact is, is that we want you present every week in worship unless you're ill or out of town. I didn't make that up. Got from Hamilton, Hamilton 15 years ago. Well, that's what you want, isn't it? We want you in worship every week unless you're ill or out of town. We don't want you sitting home just clicking the TV all the time. That's a membership expe expectation. Prayers, that you're actually going to pray for those folks. What I tell them is that, you know, that prayer list in your bulletin wasn't meant to go in the recycling can on the way out. It was meant to go home with you and go in your refrigerator or somewhere else. Gifts. There's your financial gifts. That you will work towards the tithe. That you'll be incremental in your giving and, and be growing in your giving and beyond the tithe if that's where you're at, especially. The service piece. You're going to serve in the church at least one area during the course of a year. Is that really that much to ask? One event, a weekly event, a monthly event, something. You're going to use your gifts in some way. And if you don't know what those gifts are, we're going to help you find them. We're not just going to leave you out there going, okay, everybody knows what the spiritual gifts are. Does everybody know what your spiritual gifts are in this room? Raise your hand if you know your spiritual gifts. Yeah, and spiritual gifts aren't like typing and things like that. Spiritual gifts are... Well, that's a, there's a pastor that wrote down, one point I saw that wrote down spiritual gifts, and I'm like, those aren't spiritual gifts. Neither one of the three lists, or if you take a, even a fourth list, that wasn't a spiritual gift. So, I mean, that part. And then witness, that's the hardest one. So in service for us, in the bulletin, are all the ways you can serve. X is ways to go. But that's our service piece. So there's a list of all things you can do. Here's who to call about all those ministries. The you know gifts part same way as numbers in the bulletin, but but do make sure you don't do this. Do not put your negative numbers in the bulletin. This is how much we need to have for the budget. This is how much we're short. That is, inspires nobody to do anything except come into your church, especially if they're new, and go, "Oh my gosh, this church is financially in trouble. I want to get out before I even get in." All we put in the, is a weekly offering and a total. If they want to go and figure out how much we're behind, and here's the other thing about budgets versus, you know, versus you know, actual expenses. A budget is a guideline. It is not a destination. All I care about really is, is that I got enough money coming in and there's enough money, you know, to, to pay for what's going out. Nobody will ever spend their entire budget in a church budget because we don't have enough time to do all the things we want to do. We never do that. So that's important as well, those sorts of things. So... You know, figuring out how you can put you know these things into your bulletin so that my folks see every week they see prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness, and they see for me when I'm during the offering time, I'm mentioning all these things. What I started doing for the first time is that this witness part is is that I actually take the light out at the end of the service. I had acolytes; they don't come back because they're in children's church. And I they, well, get the light out somehow, so I. I take the candle lighter and I light it. I'm asking somebody else to join me and take the light out with me. Because the light has to come forth. That's where our witness comes in. It's really hard to put. Now we do have a witness moment in our bulletin too, trying to do some of that. But, but figure out you know, how you could you do these. There's five things here. West End, figure out how they could spread these things out. How, you know, how this is going to look and that sort of thing. Um, you know, do prayers. And, this, and it has to be big. I mean, you know, we have a focus on you know, prayer for a month or presence for a month. And you go wider than presence. Presence is where worship lands, where small group attendance lands. It's all those kind of things. That's where I land those things. Gifts is financial, so you have that financial piece. Service, you know, are you doing a ministry fair? Are you actually t teaching, as the bishop said, everybody's spiritual gifts? You know, there are really short spiritual gift things you can put in your bulletin that could have 35 questions and gives them at least a basic idea of their service spiritual gifts. Are all your leaders being trained in spiritual gifts before they serve? You know, your church council, do they know their spiritual gifts? All that relates to stewardship of people and of time and that sort of thing, especially. And another piece that, that goes along with that then is something that, that goes along with that idea is a narrative budget. Have you ever heard of a narrative budget? Raise your hand if you've heard of that. Who's doing a narrative budget in their church? A couple. Working on it. Well, this is, you know, like I said, this is going to be small because, obviously, because I have a small TV. But I'll give you a, a portion of it. So narrative budget is the idea that, hey, you went away. Stop it. Lay flat. 
is the idea that instead of putting a budget out, and I've, I've stopped doing this completely anyways, which is, when I talk about stewardship, I tell, her, tell everybody, it's like, look, I'm not giving you a budget. We're going to decide on our own what it is you feel like God's asking us to give. We'll work on the budget as finance, and they have a proposed budget, and they work all their numbers out, and they do all that, but the average person in the congregation really doesn't care about your budget. What they care about is what you're going to do with the money they give you. So the narrative budget then is a way of taking, instead of line by line items, it begins to spread out the idea that, that ministry is not done in this compartmentalized way, it's, it's more of a holistic way. So for instance, if you have an administrative assistant, then their salary is spread out through the other ministry areas they all support. Because usually when we look at staff parish, what we do is look at budget and go, oh my gosh, we are paying these folks way too much. And what are the two big items that come in our budgets? Staff, parish, and trustees. Well, that's okay for trustees. they got to keep the air conditioning going because I don't want to burn up on Sunday mornings and that sort of stuff. But staff, they're a dime a dozen. We get, can we get some volunteers to do that? Why, why do we have all these paid people doing stuff? Why can't these volunteers step up and do something in this church? You ever hear that? So, so the idea here is to break this down. So for instance, when I was at Pleasant View, this is how this is broken down. I didn't create this. This is something you can go online and find lots of examples, and I'll show you one of those. Um, but direct support for ministries. This is, a, this is where all kinds of uh, allocations happen as far as communications. Youth and children budgets come under there. That's direct support. Those are particular ministries that would happen there. The congregational care landed there. Our family ministries landed there. Then there was a salary allocation because if you have a children's minister or a person like that, that salary lands there. And if there is a youth person, that salary lands there. That's where all that goes because staff and their money that you pay them is ministry. You see, we always we think somehow they're just out there doing something, but that is ministry. So $42,000 you know, of, of our ministry, 21% goes towards those kind of things. And you kind of spread it out that way. Worship and music. If you've got somebody that plays the piano, if you've got a choir leader, if you've got whatever it is, all that goes right there, and that's where you put those salaries as well. Missions and outreach. The apportionments go under there. Evangelism. Actual missions. If somebody assists in helping that ministry, their salary goes there. Education and congregational ministries. We're just Sunday school. Children's educational materials. Wednesday nights. If there's a ministry of assistance that helps out with that, you know, and usually like in a smaller church, the admin would help out with many areas. So that's what you do. You split up their salary in five different places. That's who they serve. Facilities and maintenance. There's your trustee stuff. Office administrative support. And once again, the same thing. But that's the, the narrative budget. And so I'm going to pass around some examples of a narrative budget as well. So what we did, once again, I didn't create this. The best thing is when somebody else creates it and you're able to use it. Pass those around. This is what I handed out to Pleasant View for two years, the narrative budget. The brochure that goes along with it then just simply lays out what we want to do in ministry. What do the kids want to do this year? What do the youth want to do this year? What kind of missions are we looking to do? And it lays out to them in a word form what it is our vision is for what's going to happen. And, that, and that's all it does. And so that lays everything out in the same way. So they see this. And what we say is, if you'd like to see the full length detailed budget, please contact the church office. You do not have to make it available for your people who don't really care the entire line-by-line -line budget. If they want that information, then they will probably have enough gumption to want to come to and say, you know what, I like that. And as soon as they say that, you say, here it is. But I found, we put 10 copies of that real budget out, and two were taken. They're right there. Do you want to copy of this whole budget? It's right over here. You know how many folks got those? Two. So they really don't want it. Now you'll have your person, I'm sure you have them too, who be the nitpicker who wants every line out and tracks every dollar you ever spent and ever will spend, and that's fine. Then you give them, then they can just ask for the budget and you'll be willing to give it to them. Never withhold information, never look like you're trying to be secret about it, but make people have to actually invest in getting information that gets deeper. Because the average person just needs the brochure 
It needs to know here's how the money's spent. And uh, and that makes a big difference. Any questions on narrative budget? That's the one thing that you might have questions, especially on. And it just totals it up. Our total budget was 197,864. Equals 100 percent. They can see very quickly, very, you know. 25% goes one place and 20% goes somewhere else. We're pretty evenly balanced. But if you do a regular budget, your staff parish number is always going to be this huge number and your trustees and nobody has a good sense of what actually happens in ministry. So I think this is a great idea that somebody came up with to do this uh, especially as well. Jeremy, thank you for the narrative budget concept. Do you also at charge conference reported in a narrative way we started mm. to move away from Yeah. Yeah. Um, my uh, my my reports out to people anyways for financial stuff are pretty simplistic unless you ask for something deeper. So that includes charge conference. It includes we always have the monthly budget out so you can see how the month came out and it's a nice report that opens up and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think so. I think that. I think most folks only want this level of information and they get overwhelmed by everything else. And if they want more, then they will ask. And you just you open it wide open, you say, We'd be glad to give you whatever you want. If you want every detail, every every expense, then you know what? That's what you want. And more power to you, but not that. George. Yeah, thank you. I, I have a question. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> I think we do. Mm -hmm. to these kind of innovations and not just lay it. I mean, we can sit here and say, wow, this is really, wow. We go back home, mm -hmm. and if, if the minister is not in the leadership role, then how, how do we preach to the right choir? Well, I think that we, you'd have to just start with a groundswell, kind of, which is bring it back to the finance. Talk about these things. Bring back these ideas. I went to a seminar here, and I found this. I did it the same way for me. I don't go in and say, okay, we're going to do it like this. Usually what I go in and say is, look, I'm, I've done this before, or I found this new idea, or this sort of thing, and then bring it to the group. You're right, until the, until the group begins to really gel around it. Like, this will be brand new for Good Shepherd. They have not done an narrative budget yet, and I'm waiting to see how, how much flack I get for that when we start up. Because it's new. Whenever something's new, everybody, especially on finance, uh, who are usually people who are really much, you know, this kind of way, are really you know not sure about that um, so it, it is a hard thing but I think that you just introduce the ideas you go back introduce the ideas that I saw this and that you know most pastors are going to be willing to e examine the ideas and look at the ideas and did that skip yeah yeah you, you might get some of the clips the DVD does talk about all this from uh, from the leadership the Lewis Leadership Center there's a whole section on narrative budgets and once again, see somebody else teaching. It's sort of like even us as pastors. When I go in and say the same thing again and again and again, my folks never hear that. When someone else comes in for five minutes as an authority from somewhere and says, they're like, that is the best idea I ever heard. And you're like going, I've been saying that for three years. Where have you been? Because the familiarity sometimes doesn't work against us. And if we bring somebody in who can help us to do that, and that may be one of those cases where you bring somebody in from the outside, George, and, and you have them come in and simply... You know, like we're doing right now. You have somebody come in and say, this is what I'm doing at my church, this is how it works. And then they can, you know, they can feel like you're not pushing that on them or anything like that. It's just an idea. Are there, uh, what are the churches that are in the Tennessee conference? James, I don't know. Because the problem is, is, is that our ability to be able to figure out what everybody's doing is about nil. The only thing I can tell you is, is that West End, that I happened to come across the fact that West End was doing that. Has it been successful? I don't know. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, Cliff Christopher's stuff especially um, is the same kind of thing. He's, he's gearing towards this direction too. We, we had some of this kind of thought process last year if we went to the stewardship training last year. Yeah. Can you repeat the question? 
Oh, she said that I literally say to my congregation, look at your checkbook to see where it is that your spending is to, to kind of figure out where you're, where you're at. Yeah. <laughs> sure. No. And, I, and the nice thing is when you get, I also tell them is, is that don't, you know, don't tell me it's a good sermon at the back door because the, it'll be a good sermon when we start living it out. Yeah. Yeah. And that particular sermon was, was, was that was the moment to do that in that sermon. And that sermon that it was about the the man who had stored everything up. And the and the biggest wasn't about him storing those things up. If you read that story and look at it, the, the biggest thing of that story was is that he didn't involve God in any of it. He did all on his own, he thought he did it all on his own, he did everything, but at the and in the end, what God said to him was, Look, now you've done all this, what are you gonna do with it now? You're going to be gone. So it, it, in that moment, in that sermon, then, it made total sense. It wasn't disconnected to anything else. You know, I, I don't say things harshly when I say them. I just say them matter-of-factly, which is just simply, you know, if you want to, and then people, they post on Facebook and think, that's when I feel really good about it. They're like, I've, you know, I've really been thinking about this this week. That, that, that's a good sermon. When they're, when they're chewing over at lunch and, and, and during the rest of the day, and even somebody comes back and says, you know, six days later, I've really been thinking about it all week. Now, that's a good sermon. You know, because otherwise, anybody can be touched when you have them inside, inside of our walls. But they actually start living that out. So, so yeah, I think you can do those things in, in, you know, in, a, in, a, in a way without um, being offensive about it. But once again, it begins to build the culture. I've already started from day one to build a culture, which is I am going to discuss money every week. But... I'm not going to discuss only money every week because God wants it all. God wants our prayers. God wants our presence. God wants our service. God wants our gifts. God wants our witness. And I'm talking about all those things every week. So in one way, it is a year-round stewardship thing because I'm talking about those things all the time. See, that, that's, that's the one way you might, you might start to go that direction by at least mentioning those. Because if you go up to the offering and all you're doing is you know, now it's time to receive our morning offering and tithes this morning. Please, let's just come down forward and please receive this. You're missing out on a huge opportunity to be able to talk to the congregation every week about whatever it is that, that is present. And if it's, if it's just rote and matter of fact, all you're saying is the offertory is not really important for our spiritual growth. It is a time for us to pass the plates to you to make sure we get what we need. You know, you, you don't want to build it that way. You... you I, I just think you want to focus on all those areas. And that becomes the last piece. So when I send this stuff out that we're sending around, you know, this has always been a, a real pet peeve of mine, is, is that when I was at Brentwood, and that's where I got the idea, and it was years ago, um, was that we had a card for everything you do in stewardship. Prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. Now these are fancy, because that's Brentwood. You know, but that doesn't mean Brentwood have good ideas. And I hope that you don't discount Brentwood because they're the largest church because I was at Brentwood for six and a half years and I can tell you that we were always striving to do our best and help other people too. And we always got a bad rap. But you know what? I received a lot of training at Brentwood that I still use each and every day. So don't discount the larger church and don't discount the smaller church. They're both doing great things. But these cards, so, you know, when we did these cards and this thing, and it was so funny, the first year we did this, this was the red ones, the first year we did it, um, and we sat around and talked about it. Finance could not grasp around the idea of having all of this. It was a stewardship campaign. And so finance would not let the pledge card go in orders of prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. So if you'll notice, the pledge card is a different color, and it's in the front. But that was normal. They couldn't, they couldn't get past that. But after that, then we began to look at it and started putting them all in order. Because that's the other thing. If you do this, you like you talk about all this stuff, and then all of a sudden what you do is put the pledge card, the first thing, no matter what, you have defeated the purpose of having all of those things be important. Because anybody can figure out pretty quickly is all the other stuff was just talk to get you to get me to this. And that's what you have to watch out for. So I'll pass these around too so you can kind of see some ideas of what you might do. 
So then, so what I did was, I mean, obviously on other places I didn't have the resources I had at Brentwood, uh, but I remembered the ideas. And, and I began to figure out, and now most of the days, most of the stewardship emphasis things have kind of cards to go with. But I still see most of them focus on the financial card mostly. And I don't like that. So I've created over the years, the cards have everything on them. So, so what you have is, is you have a card for prayers, and it goes from, I committed to Christ last year, uh, Bob Crossman stuff. He had a much better deal with each one of the cards. Um, but you have a continuum from the fact is I'm not ready to make a commitment to pray all the way to prayer is going to be a priority in my life. You give everybody a chance to be able to be involved in that. So whether you do it in a month span or do it in a whole year, you need to have some piece by which they can respond. That I can find myself where I am on this journey and be able to respond back. And and I did the extravagant generosity I mentioned before, then those pieces were different because those pieces were things like this. This, this is the stewardship emphasis. Things I love about my church. What do I love? And you had boards all over the building that had these cards posted on them. People who made a difference in my spiritual life. Visions and hopes for my church. And then you had a giving card. And that's how that was set up. And on the giving card and things like that, you also don't need to be afraid of the giving card either, though. I mean, like on here, I put on the giving card why it's important. And what I do is an estimate of giving. The pledge card, I don't even use those words anymore because that's a whole different thing. It has negative connotations. But an estimate of giving card. I am estimating my giving. It may change. It may go up. It may go down depending on where I'm at during the course of a year. But, and those cards, and at first I was like, okay, and those cards have a place to sign on them. So, but at Pleasant View, they'd never done this in the first place, and they weren't about to sign any cards. So what I did was, I said, well, how can we still get this across? And so what we did was, after we kind of explained how much to give, what the tithe looks like, there's a little chart for that, all of that. What are you going to do with my estimate of giving when I, when I give it in? Is there only a place for the total? That was it. And then I had them come down during that celebration kind of Sunday, and they put them into baskets. And we took them up, and we looked at them. And we didn't set our budget by it as much, because if you're looking to do that, you have to have a much different way. But I guarantee you, more than likely, what do you get? 60% of your pledge cards that try to figure out your budget by? Then you go back to what? Your checks and your regular giving, and see what that is. And then you add a little bit of cash offering in there. And maybe you might maybe leave a little room for God to be in there somewhere. And that's how, you, that's how you set how much money you think you can raise. Well, when we did this, our budget was set um, at 197 When we did this, our, our pledges, our estimates of giving came in at 205 This is a church that before this had only raised $164,000 when I got there. I did, you know, but that was that five weeks I talked about financial giving. Remember, this was the extravagant generosity. Five weeks I talked about financial giving without ever talking about giving financially, and that was all part of this whole thing. So th the point is, is that for each one of these cards and everything, then is figure out in your church how are people active in prayer ministry? What does that look like? What can they do? How can they be a part of it? For presence, what are you asking of them? Do you want to be in small groups, Sunday school classes? You know, that's one of the things. We want you to be involved in a small group or Sunday school class. Um, the gifts tab is pretty easy to figure out, but you may think about an estimate of giving instead. Um, the service piece, do you actually have a piece like it's in there where it folds out and everything that you can do in the church is on one card? And then you have a booklet to go with that that explains everything you can do in your church, how much time it takes, and all that. And so, and then the witness, the witness piece, you know, there's a witness card in here. You know, and the witness card's important too. We, we sometimes just go right past that and don't even think about it. But like, you know, will you witness and share your faith in Christ? Check all that apply. No, today I'm not ready to make a commitment all the way to... Yes, and telling others about Jesus will become a priority in my life, including the following. And it lays out this big thing. Now, these cards, on all of these cards, there was a name and a date. Because people don't have a problem with doing these kind of things. But if it shuts them down to doing this kind of thing, then that's when we lose them. And, you know, I just don't think that budgets 
are really formed off of that. And what I told them, you know, what I told them too is this, this piece I tell finance every time, which is before I ever cut a budget that we don't raise, I will go back to the congregation and tell them what's going on. Because I can't tell you how many times I've talked to folks who had no idea what was going on, and if they knew, they would have stepped up to make sure it happened. But we don't. We pretend like everybody seems to know that we're you know, $10,000 behind or something like that. But only for the budget, because I, every time I get into finance, you know, usually it becomes the issue of where we're going to cut. Never the three-legged stool where we're going to raise money, because that's, that's really what finance's job is. We're going to raise money to meet a budget which we the budget that we want to do. Finance is supposed to come in first thing and say, you know what, we're not making enough money, so what are we going to cut? Well, what kind of revenue sources do we have? How can we increase? What fundraisers can we do? You know, all those various things. But, you know, telling them, you know, is that we're not cutting anything until I go back to the congregation. They will make the decision about whether we can do this or not. When we got to that, that particular point in that October, what I said was, we're behind. We have, you know, apparently throughout the course of a couple of years, and I had enough fundraisers to cover our, our uh, property we're trying to pay off. And I said, the only places to cut in our budget now are staff and trustees. And they got the picture, which was, you won't have that children's person anymore. Or you won't have that youth person. And most folks begin to realize that. They begin to think, wait a minute, maybe I'm not where I need to be. And I just think that it's up to the congregation to make that decision, not just finance alone, because nine of us sitting in a room or whatever don't tend to have the best eyesight when it comes to our congregation. And what they're willing to do, and then if you have to come, they need to come back. If they say no, we're we're tapped out. We're everything we can give. Then you go back and you make those hard cuts, and you slash, and you you know, when I at Good Shepherd six years ago, they they had to, they had to lose the entire staff just about, start over again because they were so deeply in trouble, and the pastor there had to fire people and let them go. It was horrific. So. All of these things there are just kind of some ideas that, that I hope that will, will enable you to kind of um, get something out of it. Any last questions before we close? It's a lot to chew on, I know. Thank you. And I will send this to everybody, what I have. And, and there are a ton more links that I put in here about year-round financial examples and manuals and all that kind of stuff too, uh, especially. No, all, no, because we had never gotten to that point where it was that point. The only place that I ever saw that done at that point was Church of the Resurrection. That's where I saw when I went out there to Adam Hamilton's church 2002. They were doing that. Like they would have service was in the spring, I think is when it was. Yeah, they, they, they would just spread them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and have a focus on it, that kind of thing. Um, I think whatever I think it's whatever your church probably is most comfortable with, you start getting into that. I think this I think that this is the next step where you do the you actually focus on all all of them. The next step is then start breaking them out. But first you got to focus on them because if you just start adding them in, I mean, if you're not talking about prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness, and that's not your or whatever you choose, it doesn't have to be that. But whatever it is your values are, if you're not already focusing on those, then I would encourage you to focus on those first. And then begin to figure out how you might spread it out into a whole year calendar of how you want to do it. Like I said, West End, I looked on their website. They don't have anything up there. But I've seen the brochure that, that they had about that. And then also um, a narrative budgets and another good source, I think I forgot to pull it out, is um, Calvary. Calvary right itself. This is their narrative budget last year or maybe, maybe for this year. But they actually have this a lot, you know, it's real simple. What? <laughs> if this much? Well, mm -hmm. How do you how do you describe to them what you're actually doing in those areas so they actually know people's faces and people's ministries and things? Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. I mean, two two paragraphs I can hear for like follow. It's not too bad. I would I would make it more than that. That brochure wasn't bad for us to do. Um, I would make it a book or anything like that. But but make sure you're telling the stories. So often we go to the next thing, and what we do is we don't tell the story of the previous thing. So tell, make sure you're sharing about your children's ministry, your, your youth ministry, your adult ministry, your older adult ministry, everything you're doing, your prayer ministry. Because if you're not talking about those things, then people don't hear the story. They don't know what's going on. So I just encourage you to do that. Brent? Sure, I'd be glad to. Gracious God, I thank you so much for everybody who's gathered here on this Saturday morning to try and figure out what to do a little bit better in their churches. How can we be better stewards of all that you've given us? And how can we help our folks in the pews be better stewards as well? We look for your wisdom and discernment as we go back to our churches. So, so often it's we come with these new ideas and nobody's heard them. And so our new ideas fall on deaf ears. I simply would ask that for each person that's here when they go back that ears might actually be open. The time might be right. The opportunity might exist for you to go into the hearts of those they're going to present these ideas to. That you might soften them and make them open to receiving these new ideas. I thank you for the courage for each person here and for the commitment and dedication that they have to be here and to be in this place and be committed to serving you and all that they do. Bless us. Watch over us. Let us be a blessing to others around us. And let us continue to reach out to your hurting world. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.